writers, those beautiful wizards who create words using words. The viewers, I hope you're doing well. As usually, today we have, we're having with us a beautiful mind, a young talent, a new writer of this new and young generation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Salah Mohamed Sofiane. Thank you so much for having me here today. So I'm pleased to be here with you. Welcome to the Knowledge Channel. Super happy. Your channel. Thank you so much, man. How are you? Great, I'm fine, doing great. You came from far, far, far away. Like seriously far, man. Right? Yeah. yeah Uruguay is one hell of a far away town from here. Yeah. Yeah, Algeria is a big country, so. Tell me about it. I will, we will tell you about it. Of course, absolutely. So, Sofian, tell us more about you. The audience wants to discover you. Who is this writer? Uh, great. So, uh, Swala Mohamed Sofian here, 30 years old, uh, freelance English teacher, writer, and a blogger. Uh, a lot of things going on, including these very two books. Uh, I have been a freelance English teacher since 2014. At the time, I was still a. Uh, I still haven't gotten my Bachelor of Art. And ever since, I started developing my own writing skills. Previously, since high school, until right now, with these two very books. When did, did you discover your passion for writing? At which period of your life you said, I will become a writer? I think it came on impulse, if you know what that means. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, trying so hard to, pr to prove something out of me. I think it was writing. And at the time when I was 17, I guess, still in high school, I was drafting. It was not even writing, like for the sake of writing. I started doing it with, uh, with philosophical characteristics, things they were bigger than me, writing f practically for no reason whatsoever. That was the case. And at the time I got into college, my first novel, which I read, was uh, this will always be the best thing I have ever read so far, was Crime and Punishment by uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, I think. Fyodor the thing that got me into philosophy precisely. I mean, I drafted into philosophy, and then I started writing into philosophy. These novels with philosophical aspects. I yeah, a lot of philosophy. It was a good intermarriage. Yeah. It was an intermarriage. It was very good. So you, you wrote your first book, The Epitome of Evil in the Armada Town. Yeah. So tell us more. Uh, well, first we talk about the inspiration of this uh, evil armada who came. First part without spoilers. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Of course. I think, I think we talk about inspiration first. It's uh, the biggest battle that we witness in the universe between good and evil. It's something universal. Everyone talks about it. Outside of the box of novels, outside of the box of drama or theater, I think the combat between good and evil that got me into talking about a monster that came from different dimension and started realizing f since Armada was an outcast and everything, he thought of, uh, let's say, upgrading his own level as a as a semi-god who came into our own universe, the people like us. And that was kind of the case. That was kind of the case as to why evil come to our own dimension and create his own platform of evil and somehow does everything and indulges into the doing evil. That you, is the case. You, you created like uh, charismatic characters. Nathan, uh, yeah. his father Caleb, and his uncle Trevor. Trevor yeah. So tell us more about these characters. There are six types of characters, of course. By all means, of course. Yes. Uh, these traits. Uh, when you talk about Nathan, you, you are at the same time talking about his own father, who is practically dead into the story, as well as Trevor, who has been put away, uh, who, who had his memory erased by uh, Armada, as you have uh, known this before. Yeah. I think these three ones represent the very protagonist. Uh, Caleb's disappearance, Trevor's disappearance, and Nathan who brought this whole thing up into existence. So our mother at the time was, uh, let's say, slightly dead, half alive, half dead. Nathan found himself as a hero. He thought he was a hero. Because he, he, he was, was not planning to become a hero. Yes, uh, and, th and I think at the time being a, uh, a kid who, who was 18 years old at the time, because the whole story took three months to go down into uh, into cessation, into end. Yeah. I don't think uh, everything came to an end in th within three months. And at the time, he thought he was going to be a hero until he contacted his own Trevor, uh, his own uncle Trevor, sorry. Uh, Mr. Trevor, then he was shocked. It's like he had his memory c coming back to life. So he drove back to town. And then everything seriously exploded because Armada time was seriously, was going to be the monster who was uh, 
let's say Nathan was not going to believe his own character. Yes. He was actually his, uh, a friend of his own father and father was not dead. He was enslaved down the laboratory. Yeah, uh, an, an underground laboratory. Yeah. And th this uh, semiological image, this uh, meta metaphorical sense of the underground laboratory where evil is made. Yeah, precisely. Precisely, yeah. I think I, I did that on purpose because that has the sense of evil. I mean, you said it, you've answered the, on behalf of me, I think. You answered oh, really on behalf of me. Uh, laboratory with the aspects of dark and precisely gothic as to Armada being, uh, being able to suck energy out of people throughout the very work who was, who was actually his friend. So, so imagine a big laboratory with only one working person. It's Caleb. He, he drains their, their energy. It's like he's taking away their soul. Exactly. Their memories. No, when I, when I say energy as in their souls, because a thousand souls can equal 1% of Armada's big corpse. Really? That was the case. That was the real case. It was kind of very evil, man. A very evil. Yeah. It's a very tough villain. A tough villain, indeed. And he will stay a villain, I think, until the spoiler we talked about before. And now you can talk freely with spoilers. Ah, all right. As of now, correct. As of now. Correct. Yeah. And he, he had the, the spirit of slavery. He took everyone and turned them into slaves. That was his main purpose. They, they, were, they were put to sleep. They were alive, like you and me alive, and everything. Yes. But they were put to sleep, especially within the, uh, the monument, the, the, the commemoration of uh, Caleb. Uh, they were having a monument for Caleb there, and everyone they celebrated his uh, his death as in, uh, as in annually. So they had no idea they were being put to sleep through what the weird energy which everyone felt, and they did not know it was an evil that was doing it, except for Nathan when he first entered the Armada's house. Nathan started feeling hard. Started feeling because he was uh, possessed by Armada. He started feeling evil um, since the beginning. No, he started feeling evil since the since he was possessed by since, Armada. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's called Armada Town, and he attacked his own town. That, that was the exact uh, thing I was going to mention, which you brought up first. Thank you, Isin. I think uh, as a writer, what I like to do is I practically, I always put uh, climaxes within climaxes. So, so you think you know something, but actually you don't. So Armada was created by Johnson, who is actually Armada and everything. Yes, it's like a, a plot twist. You, you'll never guess that Mr. Johnson is Armada. Exactly, because at the time he was a normal human being. He, yeah. was, he came in disguise with Caleb and Trevor. So there was no town. There was a normal city where, with the different gated communities and everything. Everything was completely normal. He came up with the whole story and then the laboratory. When Caleb found out, he was killed and put into operation. Trevor was sent away. And then Armada was created. You can say it was a new town put into uh, construction. Yeah. That was the case with the Armada town. And then Nathan felt like a hero who has to face his destiny. Bigger responsibility than he is. Yeah. That was the case. He was a hero indeed. But then, then his, uh, his progression towards heroism was uh, somehow uh, refrained. It was stopped by his Trevor because things were seriously bigger than him. And Nathan fears a full transformation into a monster. He was fearing, that's why he was keeping himself away from his family. Yeah, he, he didn't want to hurt the ones he loves. Especially his mother, because our mother did, uh, did I'm sorry, uh, did uh, made his own allegations and hurting his own sisters, and Mrs. Karen, who, is, who was his mother at the time. Uh, but uh, he could not deal with Trevor, because our mother at the time was half alive, half dead. And Trevor was... Uh, who is Nathan's uh, uncle, who was actually a magician. So our, our mother seriously feared uh, dealing with uh, Nathan face to face. Although he was a kid and everything, but still he feared him because Trevor was there. Yeah. yeah it was a big, serious combat. And Trevor was a, good, a great magician. He was a great magician and a kind-hearted person. And I, to my opinion, I think that Trevor, who, he was the one who saved the situation, at least until our mother came to full uh, corpse and started attacking the town. Because by then, no one was able to stand against him. That was kind of the case. All right. Yeah. And, and then there is another plot twist. A lot of plot twists, man. A character <laughs> comes out of nowhere yeah. to save the situation. Exactly. I like Mrs. That. Cynthia. Cynthia. The old hag. Tell the old us woman. more about this well, mysterious character. 
and she remained mysterious until the end of the story. Yes. Yeah. I finished the book and it's still a mystery for me. It's still vague. Yeah. That's, that's practically what I do. I always, uh, let's say, uh, put together philosophical aspects within the writings. I like to do this a lot because even by the end, Cynthia was still a mystery. Uh, and so what I like to talk about Cynthia is that she, uh, she was a good friend of Caleb and Trevor at the time when they were young. And they still haven't met Johnson. Johnson at the time, he was still Armada, he was still his own dimension. Okay. Uh, well, Cynthia is a good friend uh, who was keeping an eye on Armada's activities. She knew all about it, but she had to, uh, to keep herself discreet. She didn't talk yeah. about it, yeah, because no one was there to listen to her. Everyone thought she was an old hag, if you know what that means. Yeah, a crazy kind of, woman. Yeah, it's kind of comical for her into the plot, but she had to remain comical. Uh, so one day she was snooping on Armada's activity, he was doing something with the cube. I think he was going to bring other creatures like him from his own dimension. It did not work. The cube kind of flew away. Armada did not care. Cynthia walked in and took it away and left. And she gave it to Trevor. At the time, everyone in town was, were practically beaten. They were not uh, keeping hand in hand with uh, Armada because he was seriously beating them. He was in full corpse. And so the, the cube kind of uh, helped Trevor put the way into finding uh, the real or the last resort or solution, which was Caleb, who was actually buried, uh, I think, a few meters away from the Armada town. That's what happened. They went to Caleb, they sought for help, like seriously crying, like, come on, help us, maybe we can't deal with this person anymore. He's your friend, you're an apparition, you're a strong soul, so deal with him. So that's what happened. It was throughout Cynthia, throughout the cube, the Armada was beaten. It would have been great if you added a line where Cynthia says, I told you. She did say so. She did say it to Trevor, because Trevor, when he met her, was like, my God, you're still alive. I haven't yeah. seen you in years. He said, I'm, an old, I'm no longer an old hack, and this is what I found for you. You see these weird rituals? This is, what, uh, this is what can help you eradicate evil from our own town. I think this was the uh, practical uh, line which I used. The I told you line. That, that I told you so. Yes. yes. And... We're still waiting for <clears throat> the next part. I think it's going to be a part two of the book. I think it's going to be super dope, man. It's going to be sick. Right. I promise you that because our mother was beaten down. I mean, everyone knew his uh, secret, which was a weak, weak creature. I mean, despite the... In the end, he disappears. And yet he disappears. And he still comes back because once he disappeared, the cube disappeared with him. Like all the villains, they always come back. They always come back, especially when coming from a different dimension, especially with this very aspect. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like you're, you're, you're creating a universe. Now, now you're putting the basics. No. This is the first platform. First platform. Yeah. You're creating a universe. You remind me of Tolkien, for example, and yeah. the Lord of Thank the Rings you. universe. Thank you, Thank you. Maybe you're the Algerian Tolkien. I hope so. Hopefully, man. Yes. And what was the, your main source of inspiration in the creation of this? universe, fictional universe, but with a lot of reality. A lot of melodramatic aspects. Yes. Too much drama. I think my obsession with Gothic, the Gothicism movement, and whatever it represents uh, in, stand, in the evil and good, their combat's being standardized into our own reality. This is what, what brought me to think about evil, who is a creature, who is a Satan, who is in everything, uh, who comes from a different dimension into our own world, and takes the grace out of our own planet. Take everything from our own weakness as human beings. This is what brought me into bringing this uh, super evil monster who was barely beaten, seriously barely beaten. Yeah. That was the case, man. And are, are you planning to make movies, writing scripts, starting from your books, for a movie adaptation, for example? That, w that would be a super, uh, that would be a very magnificent thing to happen for me, but I, w I would love to do it. I would love to indulge into doing this. And I, I will make the most of it. I guarantee you this one. Please make sure to keep the details. Of course, all these details are in there. <laughs> because sometimes adaptation, when you, t when you take a book and you make it, we make a movie out of it, some details are missing. It has to happen that way, you know, you know there, there's all the difference between novels and theatre. Yeah. As you know this, uh, I, I believe you do know this uh, since you are a fanatic with this. I think you're more than I am. I'm more into philosophy and writing. So when I make an adaptation, script will have to miss some points. But they can always be theatrically expressed. Well, just do it. 
I will have twin. And you will come back on another episode. I will awesome. talk about it. All right, part two. Part two, exactly. yeah. Exactly. And this universe is like in expansion. It, it is going in expansion because I have not mentioned the, the dimension of this actual human being, like yeah. Trevor, Caleb, Mrs. Care, and everything. I just put the story into a weird setting. For example, where uh, Trevor, when he, when he came rushing down into uh, town, since uh, since Jesse's the, since Nathan, I think Jesse called him to tell him that there is a monster called Armand. He was shocked. At the time, he came with his own car, and so uh, I was looking for a word in, uh, into dictionary. I found that there is a, a, a different term for the term car or vehicle or mobile. The term was right off, right hyphen off. It's off. a weird term for me. So it's a weird dimension. It's not exactly stated, but it's a mystery. You see? So uh, Je Mr. Trevor came rushing down into town with his own right off. I think you have to use the dictionary to find out that he came using simply an automobile. So this book... Yeah. Well... What do you think? When I was reading it, I was like, oh my God, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing because it's ambiguous, man. It's yeah. very vague. I don't like easy stuff, so maybe that's why I liked it. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I think that's the nature of novels. Yeah, the viewers, you, you, you should read it. You should really read it. It's really mind-blowing, as I said. Thank you, man. And then... You wrote a second book. Yeah, the second book is something very personal. Personal. It's very personal. The first one was like a, f a fictional story. It was fictional, yeah. The second one is more realistic. More realistic, it's more melodramatic. Melodramatic. Yeah. So tell us more about it, the Eclat of Jeremiah Smith. Yeah, the Eclat of Jeremiah Smith, the, uh, the amateuristically dilettante Satanist, is like a second in between brackets uh, title. And we don't have to social profile the book, since the word, uh, the last word is kind of uh, maybe derogatory to some uh, readers, especially to readership in general. But Eclat Jeremiah Smith is my own personal baby. I'd like to call it like that because I am uh, an extreme metal fanatic person. So I like the music, I have been liking it since I was a kid, and I'm still playing it right now with my own instrument. I believe it deserves to be told throughout a book, as in step number one. Uh, step number two, I mean, come on, man, help me up. What do you, like, what do no, you that, know about that, the book? So people say that a writer has a battlefield in his mind yeah. where ideas are fighting, and only the strongest ones end up in a book. Exactly, which is why I told you it's a personal, it's a personal uh, victory for me. Yeah. It finally came into a book. Man. The strongest ideas ended up in a book. Exactly. Uh, I think th this is the baby uh, that I like to... Uh, uh, give it praise and applaud more than the uh, more than the when our mother itself. Why? Because the story comes from a, let's say a high school theme. Tell us more about this, let's say, mysterious character Jeremiah Smith. Jeremiah is a very mysterious character. Yeah. Like I said, it's a personal baby, so it came from a high school theme. At the time when I was in high school, I was uh, falling in love into this kind of music. It's always uh, gorgeous, it's rough. We had a lot of tempos with uh, sub-genres and I was describing it and still I, th I think until college years at the time I was still being uh, blown away by this very music and I couldn't write a thing about it at the time simply because I was doing my homework, I wasn't googling things very well but now I think after college, after graduation, after seeing new things it's finally a book so the story is, is very simple my friend, it's, uh, it's a high school kid who wants to discover his own, uh, his own, uh, let's say his own spirit, his own soul, his, his inner self, his inner self, throughout music, uh, only I would say, self-discovery throughout music. Which music? Extreme music. You can say a lot Unlike about uh, you can say a lot about a, per a person only using the, their music taste. Exactly, or uh, or countenance. Let's say ap appearance. Appearance. Yeah, exactly. So Jeremiah Smith had no sense for, being, for looking good and everything. Although he had family w which was well off, despite the divorce that was, that was going to be, uh, let's say, destroy him even more and make him flee the country, flee the United States and go to Sweden. This was one of uh, his motives. And so uh, let's say Jeremiah Smith was... Uh, his journey began with music. Began with music, precisely from Lander, Wyoming. 
it's uh, it's a state in America, I think. Uh, and I, I said to myself, that would be the place for the birth of this uh, Jeremiah Smith. State of Lander, uh, the Lander Valley High School, which is a real high school there, uh, until his escape to Louisiana, it's another state, and meeting with the big character, who is going to be, who is going to make a very big impact upon Jeremiah Smith, uh, personal life. I mean, from Wyoming, Louisiana, until Sweden. I mean, think about it. It's it's practically a, a one-year process of uh, finding yourself. A long journey. Yeah, you're 19 years old. I mean, things are practically bigger than you. And he was being taken care of by uh, Eric. Yeah. This uh, kind of evil person. And at 19, 19 years old, some people say that 19. One plus nine, it's ten. Ten, it's one and zero. One, exactly. it's everything, and the zero is nothing. You're right. At this period of your life, you're discovering yourself. Uh, to make it even worse, you see, and I think, uh, I think when you think of the year, uh, the age nineteen, I think you think about that he has just left the puberty time. Exactly. Yeah. This is the funny part. I mean, I mean what am I think when I wrote the story? It's uh, he's uh, he's a kid who hitchhike the country, fine, when you hitchhike, go to, from the Midwest and to, to the southern part, but then you go to Sweden. Sweden. Where are you going, man? It's, uh, he it's went, way too far. He went where this kind of music It's the birth appeared, of extreme metal, yeah. The birth of extreme metal. Yeah. And what did he discover there in Sweden? That was the biggest part of me. Can we talk about spoiler here? We can, okay. It will disturb the uh, readership. They, they will have to read it. They, they will. Read it after I all. think they're going to like this episode. They will like you and they will like the book. Hopefully, yeah, because, uh, because I have been told that about, uh, concerning my entourage and the books, I have been told that Jeremiah Smith was, uh, was made a lot easier than Armada. Yeah. Armada was very philosophical and very vague. So we had to, let's say, uh, put down uh, this uh, characterization of writing. Ar Armada reminds me of Sauron in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that's, a, that's a crazy description. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, whatever what, the, what did Jeremiah discover in Sweden? Well, uh, well, he discovered a lot of things, man. Well, the first story was uh, initiated in Louisiana. I mean, not even his hometown, yeah. Lander, because uh, we didn't mention this before. Jeremiah got his own guitar. His very first guitar it was a Gibson Explorer, 1984. I was going on details on purpose because he started with the legendary rock band, and then he moved to Louisiana. Suddenly, it was oh, it was a big explosion, man. It, was, it wasn't like simple rock and roll. It was metal, distortions and machines and amplifiers. Things were crazy, and suddenly there was Eric from a melodic death metal band. I was going on details on purpose. So uh, he was skipping school. As Americans use the, like use the term punk, he punked class, and went to the Museum of the American West, which is a real place in Lander, Wyoming. And he attended uh, an old band called Obituary. And this band happened to know his friend, Mr. Tom, uh, who was uh, escaping the country, who was escaping the family and everything. But those band members they knew that uh, Jeremiah was uh, Tom's uh, son. He was the son of Tom. So they gave him the guitar as an attribute to his own uh, uh, obsession with music. Yes. Like told him to go away, go discover yourself. Do not follow us, we're old people, we don't do metal, we do rock. He went to Sweden. No, the story started from Louisiana. After that, old. and he, he discovered a secret organization. Yeah, the secret organization, it came, it came crazy upon him, he could not believe it. And there is, uh, let's say, a, a part of reality in this secret organization. Yeah. It's an organization that tries to take away culture, music. Exactly. Exactly. It, it was super evil. I mean, it was ethics. E ethics, morality. Morality. A lot of things. Especially they played on the rhythm of music a lot. Yes. And, uh, and I think when Jeremiah discovers this one, uh, he could not deal with it because it was bigger than him. And if it weren't for Eric, Engberg, the one he met in Louisiana, like I said before. The, his, his journey started in Louisiana, not his hometown, Lander. And so at the time when he met Eric, uh, let's say by chance, and Eric promised him that, uh, well, promised you like whenever when you come to Sweden, you're always welcome. It's uh, the birth of whatever you're looking for. So, and it's true, he came back to his hometown. He won the high school competition. Suddenly he's in Denmark. He did a little Google thing and he found himself that Sweden was seriously uh, upstate. It was practically in there. It was above Denmark, and he did move there, and everything was uh, was found to be true. 
there was the case, wow, Eric is here. What the hell am I doing? And then Get everything went quickly. Everything, everything turned around quickly, I mean. Uh, Jeremiah was there, uh, the biggest cli climax ever in the story, which is Alexander, uh, Jeremiah's brother. You know, we talked about it, yes. uh, the super evil. Is, and the two brothers will fight. They had, a, they had a crazy fight during the playing of the, during, let's say during the performance of Jeremiah. Performance, himself. yeah. I mean, Eric was, by, was blown away by what, by what Jeremiah was doing with the guitar. Like, you're a beginner and everything, and you play good. That's nice. Suddenly, Alexander, like, walked in and destroyed everything. With the we will not spoil the end to the viewers. Yeah. Because this one is a lot crazier than our mother. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the, the two ends are crazy. Uh, yes. Both of them are really... Of course, man. It's of mad. Course. Of course, completely. So, t tell, tell, tell me, please. Yeah. Are you planning to use the, the local, the Algerian legends and myths in your stories like a source of inspiration for you? I would say I have been pinched into doing it. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know what I mean. I have been pinched like uh, you have to stop being Americanized since there is a word for Americanized. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I did state this thing into in the introduction, the epilogue and the monologue of the books. Like most of my inspiration are coming from an Americanized, uh, let's say, cultural background. And until then, like you said, I will have to use some Algerian uh, materials. Yes. I will have to do it. And we, ha we have like really amazing legends and myths and Yes, stories. we do. And I, I've been drifting away into doing my things first, man. Like, like do your own thing and then get back to doing whatever you, you set your mind to do before. Exactly. I'm just following my own uh, state of mind. The one we started from a high school theme. It happened just now. And the first one, it also happened back in high school for me. So that was the case. There's philosophy, and this one is melodrama, still based on my own, uh, let's say... Uh, experience. Experience, yes. yes. At the same time. Sofia, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, man. The pleasure is mine. The pleasure is mine as well. You're always welcome. Feeling is mutual. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Missy. And I truly believe that everyone can become a writer as long as he remains faithful to his ideas and to his pen. Dear viewers, thank you for being with us. Thank you for watching us. Next time, we'll discover other beautiful minds. Stay tuned and see you soon.